This video provides what I hope to be a valuable interpretations and explanations of the tests of significance when running a dynamic panel model in the GMM environment. So after we run a regression, the first part of call, of course, is the F statistic in order to confirm that the model is statistically significant. And this is especially true for pooled OLS and fixed effect panel data regression. But in the case of Ariana and Bond and Blundell and Bond difference in system GMM, we're going to have to first look at the um, Hansen surrogate test to be able to answer the question are the instruments valid? Next up, we're going to have to check out the AR2 statistic to be able to answer the question is there second order serial correlation? And then next up, we check out the coefficients of the, the coefficient rather of the lag dependent variable, which I call the persistence variable. And that coefficient alpha will help answer the question, is there persistence in the model? And then finally, we check out all the regressors to be able to answer the question, are they statistically significant? And if so, how do they affect the dependent variable? And for that, we're going to be looking at the size and sign of each of the estimated coefficients. And so the first test here, the hansen sorgen test, is a test uh, for, of the validity of the instruments. And the null hypothesis is that, they, that all over-identifying restrictions are valid, meaning that the instruments are uncorrelated with the error term. The test statistic is asymptotically chi-squared distributed with m minus k degrees of freedom, where m is the number of instruments in the model and k is the number of endogenous regressors in the model. So the difference thereof refers to the number of over-identifying restrictions, noting that typically the number of uh, instruments exceeds the number of um, regressors. And so by not rejecting this null hypothesis, we in effect have support for the validity of the dynamic panel model specification. Importantly though, the instrument validity here is established when the p-value is above what's referred to as Rudman's common sense minimum threshold, which is 0.25, but it's gotta be less than one. And so we do not reject the null hypothesis of over-identifying restrictions of the validity thereof if our p-value lies between 0.25 and 1. And so we would reject the null hypothesis if our p-value is less than 0.25, even if it is greater than 0.05, as is the case in conventional tests. So a couple of implications here. Now suppose we have K regressors in the model, in this example two, and M number of instruments. So in this example, there's five of them. The Sergan Hansen test checks whether the M minus K instruments, which in this case would be three, right? Five minus two, which refer to the over-identifying restrictions in the model are valid, assuming that there are already K valid instruments, assuming that Z1 and Z2 are already valid. So it's going to be testing Z3, Z4, and Z5. There is no direct test for the joint validity of all instruments. Now you could use the wall test to test all coefficients. So a rejection of the null hypothesis which is not a desirable outcome, may indicate some model misspecification. But the cautionary note here is as follows. Unless you have a very strong prior about which K instruments are valid by assumption, in other words, Z1 and Z2, a rejection of the null hypothesis would not identify which of those over-identifying uh, over restrictions are valid. It's not going to tell us which of these three are invalid if we reject the null hypothesis. The Sergan Henson test doesn't quite provide a definitive answer, especially when you reject the null hypothesis, as you can see. 
and there's a reference here for you. In fact, Kiviet and Crip uh, gangs, I hope I, I got that pronunciation right, recommend a higher p-value threshold, that, that is more than Rudman's 0.25, in order to minimize the odds of accepting invalid instruments. So the next test uh, is the test for serial correlation. And again, the focus here is on AR2, not AR1. You probably already have figured this out because as you know, the second lag of the dependent variable naturally serves as the instrument for the first lag. And so the order of autoregression here is gonna be the second one. So the null hypothesis says no second order zero correlation. And if this is rejected, then it means that the moment's conditions are correctly specified. And conventionally, we're not gonna reject it if our p-value, the null hypothesis that is, if our p-value is more than 0.05%. So as a quick example, suppose what you see here in blue is the outcome of a panel data GMM regression. On purpose, I've struck out the, the, the result for AR1, since that's not really relevant. What's relevant is AR2. So to give this a quick interpretation, looking at the uh, coefficients of the uh, lagged dependent variable, we can see here, which is 0.72, we can see here that this suggests strong persistence in the model, in the dependent variable, because this is pretty high. Remember, it's a value between zero and one, and this is trending toward one, showing, uh, indicating that history weighs more on the behavior of the dependent variable than current events. Typical of a less competitive operating environment if, we're, if you're examining the performance of firms. The AR2 result with a p-value of 0.82 indicates no evidence of second order serial correlation. So we're quite happy about that. The surrogate test here with a p-value of 0.51 means that the null hypothesis of over-identifying restriction is not rejected because it lies within the band of 0.25 a and 1. So in essence, instruments are valid in that they are uncorrelated with the residual. So this is a desirable result. And finally, the wall test here with a p-value that's way less than any conventional level of significance means that we can accept the joint significance of all the regressors. So in the last two videos, the first described the dynamic linear model, explained the benefits of GMM estimation and outlined GMM specifications. The second one discussed the implication of the persistence variable, the lag dependent variable and its coefficients. This current video, I hope, has explained the dynamic panel GMM tests of significance and showed an example of how to interpret the model results. Going forward, I'm gonna use eViews to show how to run different GMM and system GMM. So stay tuned.